Thank you, Chris. Thank you, everyone, for turning out on a cold night. And it's always just so heartening and amazing to see so many friends. And the reason probably why I continue in this job after 33 and a half years is because the amazing people I have met continue to meet, the friends we've made, and continue to have. So it has been just a very, very rare privilege to be, to be in this position all this time. Before I launch into my talk, um, I just wanted to remind people I've got a free magazine, and uh, one of the interesting stories has to do with the first French colony in North America, which is uh, some of the topic that I'm going to be talking about tonight. And also, I've got a couple of survey questionnaires at the back of the room, so if you don't have them now, don't worry. We'll pass them out later. And tell me about the lighting. Sometimes if we turn the light off, if you're like me, sometimes you can be sleepless, and you know, if you're a middle-aged female, uh, I don't want to put people to sleep. So are we comfortable with uh, um, the lights on like this? Is it okay? I'd like, I'd like this part to go down a little. Crit to drop some of the light. Okay, so here's what we're going to try. I'm going to try. That's not going to help us. That's fine. Is that comfortable for everyone? Uh, there's nothing in between, unfortunately. Any change of heart? All right, so, so we'll launch with this. One of the um, interesting things about a story is that you never know where to start the story. And when um, I'm telling kid, my kids, I have four amazing kids, and when I'm telling my kids stories, do I start with myself, do I start with uh, David and I, do I start with my mom? Do I start with my grandmom? And we know that we're celebrating the quadricentennial of Lake Champlain this year. And this year, 1609 and 2009, somehow so many people think that's the start of the story. And I choose tonight to start elsewhere. So that's um, very much um, the beginning of, of, a, of this voyage of discovery that, that we've been embarked on. Newfoundland um, is a very interesting place. And how many have you, of you have been to Lanso Meadow at the northern tip of Newfoundland? Well, let me tell you, this, you need to put this on your to-go to place. Um, if you hate flying, you can get there without going on an airplane. Uh, we went with three babies and uh, a beat up car. And it only took us, I think, I don't know, a couple days to get there. And what happened here is, unbeknownst to a lot of people, the very first recorded uh, European venture in the New World was right here at Lanso Meadow. So in the year 1001, a boatload of Norsemen, and uh, there were probably some women even in that very first year. And it was uh, Eric the Red. He, they were settled in Iceland and then had gone over to Greenland. And they were always looking for wood. There was no wood in Greenland. And so in the year 1001 is our first documented uh, European venture and the first time that um, we know Europeans met indigenous people. In the year 1008, uh, Leif's son, uh, Eric's son, Leif Erikson, comes with three boatloads of people and two, 250 people. And they're bringing cows and um, one of the women named Gudrid gives birth to the first European in recorded history again in the New World. And um, they had pretty, pretty early on a pretty checkered history with the indigenous people. They called the indigenous people Skraelings. And Skraelings was, uh, well, before I get into the Skraelings, so they were traveling in this particular boat called a Knar. And Samuel Eliot Morrison is my Bible for some of these early voyages. And um, this was an open boat, and it was like 55 to 65 feet long. And uh, they sailed by just latitude, they, they called it latitude sailing. They just pointed uh, west and just kept the, the North Star on their starboard, right in the center of their starboard post, and just ended up in the northern tip of Newfoundland. And uh, they had 
sleeping bags, apparently, of um, uh, sheep skin or uh, cow skin. And here you can picture this water just kind of flooding in into these canars. And with this uh, latitude sailing, they landed right here at the northern tip. And Lanzo Meadow is somewhere over a little bit to the left side. And this is a geographic place in North America that uh, stands out repeatedly in the voyages of discovery. And sometimes in the world, there's a piece of geography that you just keep on running into. <coughs> and we'll run into this piece of geography again uh, momentarily. So uh, starting with Leif in 1001, and then with Eric, and then Leif Erikson in 1008, they had these little boats. And they ran into the Skraelings, which was their word for uh, unattractive, hairy, and ugly. <laughs> and uh, they, were very, they, were, they were afraid of each other. It was almost as if the indigenous people really hadn't seen Europeans before. They were very interested in the red wool and in the sheep's milk. And there's a book here called The Far Traveler, Voyages of a Viking Woman. And one of the amazing um, experiences for me in working on this project, this Voyages of Discovery project, is there are things that I hadn't read since undergraduate school. And I just had the opportunity to explore some pretty extraordinary literature. And who would think that Samuel D. Champlain has anything to do with Viking women? But this is a fabulous book put out by Nancy Marie Brown. And I've got it here in the front. And if you're interested in, in what was going on. Um, when I was a girl, I was born in Italy, my parents are Italian, and I would come home talking about this guy named John Cabot, who sailed for the English in, 1940, in uh, 1497, so five years after Columbus. And mom would say, he's not English, he's Italian. His name is Giovanni Cabotto, and he was a Venetian, and also grew up in Genoa, and then s went off to Bristol, England with his family. So John Cabot, um, <laughs> Amazingly enough, with latitude reckoning, although he finally had a uh, compass, also landed at the northern tip of Newfoundland. His second trip, he didn't do so well. Uh, he disappeared, and no one saw him again. <laughs> and these were uh, these incredibly tiny boats, again, 50 to 60 feet long, and maybe a single sail. And the Portuguese fishermen uh, are are an un unsung heroes and un unsung explorers. But very, very quickly, they became what the Norsemen were. The Norsemen were phenomenal sailors, and the Portuguese seamen became that way. Very quickly, they learned about the cod off the southern banks of Newfoundland, and also the whales off of Labrador. And so probably the same person who's been to Lanso Meadow has been to Red Bay, Labrador, correct? No. Has anyone in this room been to La Red Bay, Labrador? All right, but that is the number two spot to visit on the North American continent. Red Bay, uh, basically from 1520 to uh, 1580, Red Bay, Labrador, even further in the northern tip of Newfoundland, was uh, a whale station that was used repeatedly throughout these decades. And Parks Canada has found the remains of this very special little boat um, in the freezing waters of this teeny little inlet. And uh, so in this particular place, again, the indigenous people were communicating with Portuguese whalers and Basque whalers and having these um, probably the beginning of certain sophisticated relationships. And the reason why I'm really wanting to give you this kind of context is that we think of Champlain as the first, 1609 is the first, but I just happened to start the story in 1001. And we could be backing up the story and starting, of course, with the native history before the European showed up. In 1534, there was a very dramatic thing happened, uh, Jacques Cartier. Sail, sailing for the French, uh, explores far bigger area than anyone had explored so far. And um, 
One of the things that I didn't mention is that there was an earlier sailor who actually started kidnapping Indian peoples. The very first written uh, record of indigenous people being kidnapped was in 1501. Caspar de Corte Real brings two Indians back to the court of Spain. And uh, there's, and this is so the stories about what was happening in the New World are very much, uh, it's like a, a it's almost like a bestseller, okay? It's in, the, in the courts of Europe, you're starting to hear these stories. So uh, off goes Jacques Cartier, and he did a, a number of voyages. And Cartier's claim to fame is that he really explored all these different bays and all these different coastline, coastlines and actually named places. So he did, he came to the same spot that you can see where the Norsemen were and right up here at Lanzo Meadow, same spot that uh, John Cabot and others. Cartier, I would say, uh, absolutely was the first of the European uh, explorers that had very intimate relations with the indigenous people. Um, they started trading fur very quickly, and in fact, the knowledge of the fur trade already existed by 1524. And Jacques Cartier came up to St. Lawrence, you probably know this, and ran into this large Indian village in Montreal called Hochelaga. And Cartier's men were horribly sick, and he had lost many dozens of men to disease, to um, scurvy, in fact. And it was the indigenous people that, much to their regret, I'm sure, gave them um, some uh, evergreen plant that had so much vitamin C that all of Cartier's men recovered from scurvy. Um, the Indians laughed at Cartier because they were really interested in very old beaver hides. If you had a beaver hide that you'd been wearing for 30 years, that's the one they wanted. They did not want new beaver skins. Apparently, they learned very quickly that the prized beaver hides were the, the, uh, the richer in oils, and the ones that had been worn and used and loved and slept in and lived in. And the Indians thought this was howlingly funny. What kind of nutty white people are these that are interested in our old stuff? Um, Cartier was one of those explorers that felt the indigenous people to be uh, beneath them, to be inferior, to uh, lack in the high values of the French. And he kidnapped the, um, kidnapped. he kidnapped some warriors on one trip, several trips. He actually invited the elders and some of the leaders of Hochelaga back to France. And so when Champlain starts, uh, thinking about coming over and starting to uh, investigate the fur trade, there had been this decades of interactions between the Indians and the French from <coughs> 1534 to 16, uh, 1603. This little creature um, was probably the greatest source of cultural and uh, cultural change in human history on the North American continent. And it devastated indigenous communities in terms of uh, territorial wars. It devastated indigenous communities because of the Europeans going after the fur trade. Um, in Lake Champlain, by the time, uh, sh shortly after Champlain was here, there wasn't a single Dutch trader, there wasn't an Indian. There wasn't a Frenchman who was not involved in the fur trade. So this was the whole history of North America very much involved around that. Now, one of the things I learned in my uh, really interesting research in the last few years is that 1609 is not the most interesting date of all. But it was actually 1603. Because what happened in 1603 was Champlain's first voyage from southern France. Champlain was this uh, extraordinary person. And unlike Cartier, he came from a very different uh, um, so social or and moral value. 
He had lived through the religious wars in France, and he had seen what happens when people are at war. And before he came to North America, he actually took a couple of trips to the Caribbean, and he saw how the Spaniards dealt with the uh, Indians of the Caribbean, and he saw the Spaniards enslaving the Indians and enslaving Africans. And he said, I will not do that. I will not treat these people the way the Spaniards are treating people. And so he came to the New World in 1603 with a sense of peace <coughs> that is very untypical of your average 16th century male, okay? Or even your average 21st century male, perhaps. He came very much not wanting war. And um, he sailed up the St. Lawrence with uh, the person under which he was, he was actually um, not in charge of the ship. He came as uh, an extension of the king. And at a place called Tadoussac, which should be really important in our understanding of North American history, and I'm just new to this stuff myself. And there on the St. Lawrence, he found hundreds of Indians. And they were uh, gathered there at... Um, the village of Tadoussac at the mouth of the Saguenay River. And there were Montagnais, there were Edgemans from Maine, there were um, Ab West, uh, Eastern Abnakis, there were something like nine or ten different tribes. And they, mm -hmm. this is where he first realized that the indigenous culture was incredibly sophisticated. They were wise, they were experienced, they had very different social values. People, uh, one of the things, one of the stories that uh, Hackett Fisher tells uh, in, his, in his book, Champlain's Dream, the Indians decided to come out and look at Champlain's boats. And the elders and the leaders of the tribe grabbed their women took down their huts and then like, like that, jumped into their canoes and it wasn't the typical European thing where they sat and, and the slaves and the servants did the work. It was the leader of the community who was the first one to take down his hut, the first one to jump into his canoe, and the first one to go flying across the water. And he was just so amazed at how brilliant they were on the water. And they were in these little, the, the, the French were in these tippy little chaloupes. And here are the indigenous people in these canoes, just loaded with gear and loaded with people. And they were just flying across the open St. Lawrence River. And he, he never forgot that. So in 1603 is when Champlain promised these indigenous people that he would help them against the Iroquois. And he would go to Lake Champlain and help them. So what really was going on as we go into our 1609 story is um, Champlain had promised them help, and the Indians were taking advantage of Champlain. So when we read about Champlain as the great European, and the reason why we know about him is he wrote about himself, and other people wrote about him. No one was writing about the Indians <coughs> except Champlain a little bit. The other thing about Champlain that was extraordinary is his map-making abilities. He wasn't just your average sailor. He wasn't just your average diplomat. He was a Renaissance man. This is Andre Senecal's word. Just the, the perfect Renaissance man who just enjoyed meeting these new people. And these are some of his maps. And he made these incredibly detailed geographic maps. And the other thing he was, was um, an ethnographer. He was really interested in what people were wearing and what people were eating and smoking and plants. And I don't know if in the back you can see this, Bobby and, and Christine, but he's got these absolutely Audubon level drawings. And apparently he loved birds. He, took, he, did, he just did thousands and thousands of drawings and he kept journals of everything. So Champlain promises the indigenous people, I will help you against the Iroquois. The indigenous people say, aha, we're taking advantage of this European guy who happens to have a gun and has a lot of power. And the Indians promise him that there isn't a single falls that will stop their chaloup. And so they get to Chambly, and Champlain goes, what are you talking about? I don't think I can get around these falls in my little chaloup. 
And so they were very impressed that he actually walked around with a couple of his men and explored by himself. They were impressed with his um, courage. And so I think that was very much part of the relationship. There was this mutual respect that did not exist with other European explorers. So what happened was they got as far as Chambly as they were heading <laughs> up Lake Champlain, and they couldn't go any further because of the rapids. And so for the first time <coughs> to, in recorded history, Champlain gets into one of their canoes. They leave the French boat behind. Champlain leaves all his men behind, and off they go in one of the... Um, in one of the canoes that he's always been so impressed with. So just qu quickly moving forward with our story, because this is just the beginning of the story. I haven't really gotten into the story that I'm here to tell you about. Uh, Champlain traveled across the Atlantic, I think something like 34 times. So when we think about Champlain, you know, he came one time, he came two times, he came like 34 times or 27 times. Some enormous number of, uh, of voyages. Um, shortly, in a very little period after Champlain's trip into the lake, uh, by about, I think, 1613, just a few years later, the Jesuit missionaries were already here. And the Jesuit missionaries themselves had an extraordinary role because they wrote. These guys were like Champlain. They kept notes, and they kept journals, and they wrote letters back to France. And these letters were actually um, PR pieces. It was like advertising. They were like fundraising. They needed more money for their mission, so they would write these glowing letters back to the court of, uh, in Paris, to the royal court, and say, oh my gosh, everything's going swimmingly, and oh, everything is wonderful, and the people are wonderful, and we're healthy, and um, and every once in a while, one of the Jesuits would really would sort of throw in the reality check. But these letters called the Jesuit Relations, which are on the internet, and they're, if any of you are teachers here, those are amazing primary documents. You might want to vet them first to make sure that uh, you're comfortable with what the kids are reading, because some of them are perhaps violent. And, uh, and Champlain's journals are also on the internet. Uh, there's a lot of open source literature because this is old, old stuff. But the Jesuits have amazing uh, stories about the indigenous people, about plants, weather, seasons of the year. So there's a, a tremendous amount of writing in the Jesuit relations, even though uh, they're dynamic with the indigenous people. You know, we would have some issues with some of that. Um, fast forward into the end of the 1600s, and the fur trade is the heart of Saturday night in North America. The English are starting to make noises about coming up from Albany, and so King Louis the 14th and Louis the 15th both decide they've got to uh, show their might. So here they are in Lake Champlain. They do a series of forts. We have Fort St. Anne in 1666. Who's ever been to Isle of Mott, to Fort St. Anne? We have a few people who've been there. Excellent. So this is a very early fort, uh, 1666. There's a series. And by about 1731, the French say, we've got to get even more serious. And they built this next fort at Chimney Point. And Chimney Point, of course, is our beloved state historic site right here in Addison. Yeah. That, that, that's another story that's re revolution, that's further down. Well, when you're crossing over to uh, the bridge, there's a right, you go down towards Route 125 and cross over in the town of West Addison, over to Crown Point. Right there is the Chimney Point State Historic Site, and this is the original fort built in 1731 by the French. And it looked perhaps like this. So this is a uh, drawing over at the Crown Point Museum of what is very possibly underneath our Chimney Point State Historic Site. And the French decide they need to, they need to get even more serious. So after that first fort, they then build this fort, 
Port St. Frederick over at Crown Point. And this is, for all intents, this medieval fort, this medieval castle with a moat. And uh, Tom Hughes is here, who's the director of the Crown Point State Historic Site in New York, but he lives in Vermont. That's to tell you how much he loves Vermont. And this particular type of architecture was worth nothing in a military event. Real cannons, real dynamite would blow this in seconds. But the French built this, you know, with their usual uh, good taste and their usual elegance. They said, well, we'll build something that looks like this. It wasn't necessarily uh, going to be helpful in times of war, but at least it was a presence. The um, French king, both uh, Louis XIV and the XV, said, we've got to get some settlers there. It's not enough to have militaries. We need to actually have living people there. So they created these uh, seigneuries. And the seigneury is actually a plantation. It's a feudal enterprise in North America. So this was a translation of feudal France right here in the 1730s uh, and 40s. And this Hocart seigneury right here is where our story for the project that we got involved in is right here. So Crown, I think Crown Point is like right here, right? And Chimney Point. So this is the Hocart seigneury. And the French king said to the seigneurs who were the owners of the seigneuries, you've got to get people in there right now. You've got to get settlers in there. Well, very few of these actually were settled, except the whole cart seigneury was indeed settled. And when you look at this piece of geography, you've got Crown Point on one side and Chimney Point to the north. You can tell why people always thought it was spectacular. I have not heard this personally from uh, my Abnaki friends, but there's little doubt that they would have thought this a sacred landscape from time immemorial when you're canoeing up the lake for thousands of years, this is the area you encounter. So you can see why the French themselves thought this is a really important part of our landscape. And it continues to this day. So this takes us to Elsa Gilbertson. And Elsa's not here tonight, but in March 2006, Elsa calls me up and said, I got this postcard in the mail. And do you want to get involved in a grant with me? We can apply for a quarter of a million dollars. And we can let the world know why Chimney Point and Crown Point were the heart of, Amer of, of world history. Why don't we do that? And because we're both really crazy, we go, yeah, that's a fabulous idea. And our managers, um, they didn't know enough to say, no, 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 this is going to be a whole lot of work for everyone. And so we applied with two other partners. We applied with the Bixby Library, Rachel Plant. Some of you know her at the Bixby Memorial Library. And we applied to this uh, remarkable grant also with Vermont Public Television. And Carol Thompson signed on as our filmmaker to do a video documentary. So right here, Elsa had been looking at this landscape for all these years. She'd been telling these stories about right here in our backyard, we had these French settlements. We had these military forts. We had, we had everything that was happening in the St. Lawrence. It just sort of came down our way. We had the fur trade. We had all this stuff here. Oops. How did we get to the end? Ah. All righty. That doesn't happen to me very often. Well, <coughs> Italians are always touching things. My husband says, don't touch anything. Um, let me go to slide sorter and just quickly get us back. So I apologize, Chris, for your DVD. All righty. All right, we're here. And then I'm going to put <coughs> view. And we're going to go slideshow. Darn. All righty, so much for technology. We're almost there. All right, so the Institute of Museum and Library Services awarded us this grant for two years with these different partners, which I just already mentioned. And the project components were this archaeology, field investigation, and 
Uh, we did a video for public television and uh, our interactive website, exhibits. Everything's coming due. Again, what is that about? Why would it go, hmm, I just skip like that. Isn't that interesting? Hmm. Hmm? No, it's on manual. So, well, I apologize. <coughs> I apologize here. I'm just going to maybe keep that on like that so we don't lose it. And what's that? Go away. <coughs> Oops. Oh, fantastic. This is a first. What is this? Huh. Maybe we'll do undo here. Undo insert chart. It's a good idea. All right. So, hmm. If I go to slideshow, we're going to do show. Right? Nope. Okay. Well, this is called life. <laughs> right? When you have kids and grandkids, you don't worry too much about things like this. And I know what I did wrong. I know what I did wrong. All right. I know what I did wrong. All right. Yay. All right. Those French seigneuries created these spaghetti lots. And there were over 150 French settlers that came. The Fort St. Frederick was the mall, the shopping mall. And uh, there was three quarters of these little spaghetti lots, and I don't know if you can see them in the back, were settled by uh, French farmers, half of whom were soldiers. This uh, painting of uh, 1760 by this uh, Canadian named Davis shows this teeny little house right the year after the French um, were pushed out by the English in 1759. So what you're seeing here is the Crown Point, which was essentially this hamlet, and the French settlement sites all along the Lake Champlain shore. I apologize for before. The spaghetti lots that existed in the French seigneuries continue now. So if you were to see um, the, the plot lines, and you can almost see a little bit the little hedgerows running east and west. So we're right here in this particular geography, right north of Chimney Point. And when I started working here in 76, all I could hear about were these iconic cellar holes, the French cellar holes at the DAR State Park, and all up and down the shoreline from north to Chimney Point and south. And so we said, fine, let's do the archaeology of these French cellar holes. Uh, some of the written records suggest that there were uh, foundations underneath the, these dwellings. And we wanted to confirm archaeologically whether indeed the cellars were, were French or later English. Um, one of the things that we've learned from um, Andre Senecal and then other readings is that these French settlers, uh, some of them may very well have been voyagers. And the voyagers were basically indentured ser ser servants from the St. Lawrence that became part of the fur trade. And they very much got involved with the Indians' way of life. Uh, this Frenchman here, who we think lived at the DAR State Park, uh, had tattoos on his legs. They dressed very simply. This apparently was their everyday clothing. They had very little material culture. Their um, housing had, there was no glass, there was very little hardware. So, we're f so the question was, would we even find them archaeologically? So right there at the DAR State Park, you know, on a day like today, you can picture on a day like this, you know, it's nice and flat. And they would canoe over to the fort for their bread and for all their supplies. And, um, and we think that they were probably expert uh, uh, boatsmen, expert paddlers. So in the summer of 2007, 
we started excavating at the site. We uh, did a lot of publicity looking for volunteers. Uh, I created a syllabus for teachers and uh, gave them an option of one week, two week, or three week, and we had 15 phenomenal teachers that joined us. And the first day, there were 40 people that just showed up between the teachers and the volunteers, including my Italian cousin, who'd never even seen a mosquito and ended up spending uh, a week uh, tenting. The University of Maine Farmington was extraordinary. They were uh, my consultants for the excavation. And what we do with the teachers in the morning, we would be excavating and really uh, helping everyone understand the mathematics of the archaeology, how levels work, stratigraphy. And we ended up excavating actually quite a bit, uh, quite a few s square yards of the two cellar holes of the DAR State Park. Uh, the teachers had not been exposed to some of the primary records, no, no more than I had myself, so this was a good time for all of us to learn. And so parts of the voyages of discovery was all of us kind of learning together. And that was a big part of this experience where we were all learning new things. Um, we were learning about Abnaki, uh, contemporary Abnakis, Jesuit relations, um, amazing literature that's out there for the reading that we just don't necessarily find time to read. And then doing the laboratory work all together there at Chimney Point State Historic Site. We had a, a little building set up for lab. Uh, seminars in the afternoon, field trips to Crown Point. And one of the things that, uh, that hit home very early is that we found very little French material culture. And we were reminded of the Viking site up at Lanso Meadow where only two Norse artifacts were actually found, the spindle whirl and a bronze pin. When we started finding very little French material culture at these sites, the question was, um, are we in the wrong place? Is it because the French were able to take what they had and head back to the St. Lawrence when the English came and chased them off in 1759? Or was this a society of, recy of recyclers and minimalists, so there was really very little there? We found, for example, this French faience, this teeny little chip. So you can see the size of some of the fragments we were finding. And the question was, is this, in fact, a French faience plate dating from the French settlements? Or was it, in fact, the next uh, generation of uh, English settlers who maybe had a French faience plate with them? Uh, there are very specific looking uh, ceramics used by the French in the 1740s and 1750s period. And this could be the item on the right um, has this little bit of uh, green glaze. The question is, is this a possible English piece? Um, one of the things that the locals in Addison will say, well, that those aren't French cellar holes. That are, those are the English uh, settlers who built on top of the French after the English left. John Strong came in 1765 and built, according to all the Addison County histories, he built right on top of one of the, of the French cellar holes. In 1766, uh, he came with his wife, Agnes. And um, there's some amazing stories. They had all these bear problems. And there's one bear story after another. And this one particular story, they didn't have any doors, that first generation English house, right at the same location as the French settlement. They had a blanket. And this bear came in, knocked over the cooking pot. And um, the question is, you know, you can picture some of these artifacts that we found just being, uh, you know, they accidentally broken because these are people that did not throw things away. We found um, very much English um, pearlware from the uh, 1780s period, 1770s. We found uh, these clothing items and quite a lot of cutlery, a lot of um, 
gun flints, and all of this material seems to us to be English. We found uh, a great deal of bone, animal bone, so we were able to reconstruct the fact that they had all these domesticated animals there. So we're finding cows and turkey bones and pigs and sheep, and also all the usual suite of wild creatures, rabbit and freshwater clams and quite a lot of landlocked salmon and stuff. Um, buttons, this very, very interesting coin that seems to date from uh, early the 1730s or 1740s, but you can see how worn it is. It's practically impossible to tell what it is, and perhaps this honey-colored flint uh, may or may not have been French. One of the frustrating things is that um, there's at least two dissertations or more of analysis and laboratory work that, that needs to be done in the future. This was a fascinating artifact made of soapstone, the piece on the left and the lower right. And I'm just really wondering if they were uh, artifacts that maybe came from the St. Lawrence. If you know, we know that there were uh, soapstone pots used on the St. Lawrence, and no one has ever seen anything quite like this. And this other mystery artifact may be used by some um, uh, contemporary indigenous person, maybe as some kind of a sharpening stone, but that looks uh, very um, Native American, but it was right in with, uh, with the materials. Um, one of the things that we've learned is that the archaeology has contributed a great deal to uh, fleshing out a little bit of the, of the story from um, the, the Addison County written records. We've learned again that the negative information has been um, uh, problematic. Are we in the right places? Are we, are we in, the, in the locations of the French settlements? We know that there were over 200 people living in those spaghetti lots in, between 1740 um, and 1759. And where are those French settlements? Um, and our story is just really kind of starting. We've got a publication we're going to get out in about six weeks. And one of the reasons why we want you to sign up so we can get you a copy of that publication for free. We're going to have a website that's going to connect a lot more of the dots about what we found and um, you know, additional places to look for more information. And, and basically, it was just this extraordinary experience where we just got a, just a glimpse of the, the tip of the iceberg of what lies right here in our history. But I think one of the more important stories for us was looking more broadly and trying to understand the, the bigger issues of North American history that led us right here into, into Addison County. So I think that is it for tonight. And I hope I didn't go on for too long. And I'm happy to take questions. And, and one of the things I would love you to do is, um, you know, Fill out those survey questionnaires about what did you not know that you'd like to know more about, or okay. yeah. So the couple that you kept showing the the Fayards, Mr. and Mrs. Fayard. How do you know how to dress? Um, Andre Senecal is this uh, professor of uh, Canadian studies at UVM, and he was our guru when it came to. Uh, French in Addison County. And he had done an enormous amount of work in the Canadian archives in terms of looking at paintings and looking at um, um, inventories. And so that was his best guess as to what people were wearing. And apparently they would never have worn like military <laughs> uniform even though half the settlers were soldiers because they would have gotten stuck walking through the trees. They would have looked ridiculous. Um, so apparently that was very common in uh, 18th century French settlements, that kind of coarse, very simple. No undies apparently. The women did not wear undies, but they all had knives. They had a pocket <coughs> in that garment and they had a special knife. Tom, does it have a name, that knife? 
that you have an example over at Crown Point. And it was an old purpose, use the one. The, the, That's Andre's story, so we'll continue to uh, re repeat that. You must have a thousand other questions because I skipped over so many decades of history. Doc, what, what are your plans for this, this next summit? The grant is uh, finished as soon as we get the publication done and the website. And uh, one of the things we learned is that these pro projects cost a great deal of money. And the reason for that is that the, the only way we were able to have that many volunteers is we had like eight archaeologists on site. And so there's other ways of doing it. There's other models. There's other things. Unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm one of one. And so we need to craft a program so we can do more of that. Right now, the only summer program is in the Green Mountain National Forest. And David Lacey is the archaeologist in Rutland for the Green Mountain National Forest. And do you think they, you might be inviting volunteers up to your project in the mountains this summer? Well, I've been several weekends and days. Yeah? yeah. Uh, well, one of the things to do. Okay, so one of the things to do is if you um, will give me and sign in, there's like a sign in sheet. If you'll give me your um, email or your snail mail, I'll let you know about David's uh, project. It's a pre contact Native American site at about 3,000 feet in uh, Wallingford, 2,000 feet. Wa Wallingford, Mount Tabor area, and uh, Two miles up the Long Trail, and it's a stone quarry site that was found a number of years ago. Very, very important native site used for thousands of years. And so it'll be very different than this kind of archaeology. But yes? Besides Camp Brown Stream, what other good books that sort of lean into the uh, uh, On the Champlain, on the Champlain oh, story? W. Yeah. Well, Samuel Elliott Morrison is still a splendid uh, writer, and uh, he did two volumes, the Northern Voyages and the S Southern Voyages, and he's a mariner himself. He was a sailor, so he really gets, if any of you are sailors, Morrison with a one R, M-O-R-I-S-O-N, Samuel Elliott, uh, he just goes chapters into the sailing and the rigging and uh, that aspect, and he actually sailed all these places himself in person. Uh, uh, Coolidge's book is c kind of boring and technical. He wrote the French occupation of the Champlain Valley in the 1940s, which has been reprinted since. Uh, the Jesuit relations are very interesting, just and, and, and some of them are beautifully written. They're like written in contemporary, uh, well, they're translated, of course, and I don't read old French or even new French. Hi, come on in. Uh, but those are very interesting things that I'm trying to remember. So our website will have just lots and lots of information for additional reading. And um, it's going to be historicvermont.org. And we'll have a big tab for the Voyages Project. And uh, the internet, I have to say, is an extraordinary resource. You know, I, I didn't have time to scan my family pictures of Lanzo Meadow, and I've been wanting to for a couple of years, and I just wandering off through the internet and finding all these pictures of Lanzo Meadow. And, um, and Parks Canada has fabulous information, and uh, the Canadian Archives also. If you want to not talk to your family for months, <laughs> just wander off into the Canadian Archives. And they have scanned just thousands and thousands of uh, primary documents and maps. And of course, it's Smith's, uh, the, the Library of Congress has all these maps. Fabulous, fabulous stuff, those of you who wallow in maps and love maps. Uh, 
But the Canadian archives is really a very interesting place. Also, the Museum of Man in Ottawa uh, has a fantastic website, and they have uh, different eras of exploration. And this book is the one that I mentioned, uh, Nancy Marie Brown, The Far Traveler, Voyages of a Viking Woman. It's beautifully done because she's taken the sagas, and there's two sagas that talk about the Norse voyages, the two um, Icelandic sagas. It's called The Far Traveler. And, uh, and she's added a bit of a fictional spin to it, but it's based on archaeology. She spent months with archaeologists in uh, Greenland and Iceland. And it's a very sweet little book. So anyway, so we'll look for the website. And if you signed up tonight, I will email you when the website is also done so we can continue sort of a, a dialogue together. Yeah? What's up on why the Norse didn't make it? Why didn't, uh Every, everything I've read is that the Indians, the indigenous people, and I'm not sure if they were Innu, <coughs> Indian or Inuit, Eskimo. Uh, apparently, they aren't quite sure. Uh, it was enough for them to say, we, got it, we can't be here. The skirmishes, the, they felt they were being always uh, surprised by different attacks. They just seemed to have a very hard time dealing with the Indians. The Norse were the first ones. Well, the French very quickly had these trading relationships. And so the French were coming not into a new world. It was actually a world of existing trading relationships because the Basque whalers and the, um, the, 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 the Basque and the Portuguese, um, the French whalers, had started all these uh, trading networks early on. So what, what the, f feel free to add your thought. Okay. No, it's probably no, very. It's 500 years later. And it's 500 years later, yeah. So the French had this network already, and the Indians were looking for the French because they liked some of what they were offering. They liked the alliance possibility. They liked the trading goods. They didn't realize what else was coming with the Europeans, diseases, the demise of their lives, and everything else. Davey? I was just going to say, that, that book that you guys have there, <coughs> even if you can use it, the Norse were very wary of the ramifications of this. But they were, they were very keen to stay out. That's right. That's right. Yeah. They didn't feel like they were very defensible. Uh, well, well, yeah, that's a really good point, too, because of those uh, Norse boats had no cover, remember. They had, uh, they were like minimalists. They were like an oversized rowboat, basically. Whereas by the time the 1500s rolled around in Cartier, they had uh, decking, they had compass, they had, um, the whole boat had extra sails, uh, more stable. They, there was a third trip, in, uh, uh, according to the sagas, in uh, 1013, a third group came over, and they got into uh, uh, beef. The, there were two families, and there was one very mean-spirited woman, according to the sagas, and this one mean-spirited woman lied and cheated and said bad things about the other family, and it went south. The, the dynamic, they were there, I think, several years, and then they headed back, and that was it. And according to the sagas, they did not go back to Lanzo Meadow, but according to some of the sagas, they continued to go to Labrador to look for wood, because one of the things I didn't mention is when they came to Lanzo Meadow, they carried their housing with them in the boats. Wood was so scarce that they carried all their timber with them in their boats so they could build their houses at Lanzo Meadow. And you can imagine this kit and caboodle. Talk, they can do that. We can certainly all go to Lanzo Meadow and to Red Bay <laughs> from Addison, from Middlebury. I, I seem to recall an unspelled initial theory that they might have come here. 
Yeah. No, it's definitely archaeologically. Um, there is a Canadian archaeologist named um, Helga in Ingstad was the Danish archaeologist that found it in the 60s, and it was the big National Geographic story in 1964. Um, but since then, there was, uh, what's the name of that um, woman archaeologist in Parks Canada? Since then, they've done more analysis, more studies, and they've looked at uh, analogous sites in Iceland and in Greenland, and they feel 100% archaeologically that these were the Norse sites and Norse settlements of considerable size. I think you had the next question first. Tom, do you know that? Who else knows the answer to that? Um, the Fort Anne at Isle of Mott, um, Fort St. Anne, Fort St. Anne, Fort St. Anne, Anne is at Isle of Mott, and Fort Anne is the one in, in Whitehall, down in the lake. Except it's by the British. Yeah, I think Fort Anne is the British. British, okay. So that's a British fort, the experts are telling. Um, do you have a question? Horribly. Yeah. Horribly so. There, um, there's estimates that over easily 90 to 95 percent of the coastal villages of Maine were, and the entire Northeast Maritime coast were destroyed by uh, the European diseases, smallpox, influenza, 90 to 95 percent. And the Decimation by disease was such that even though some of the Indian communities were hundreds of miles into the interior, communities that had never seen a European were still being decimated by disease just by traders. The fur trade, and this is all part of the problem with the fur trade, is that it was like an octopus. And uh, there are European artifacts hundreds of miles from the nearest physical contact with Europeans very early on by like 1570s, uh, in 1600 in interior um, New York State. And one of the things, I actually just happened to be reading it the other day, is that they think that the turning point for disease was about 1620 when they started bringing children over. And that as long as it was just sailors, um, there seemed to be more immunities, and so people weren't quite uh, as sick, other than with scurvy. But those kinds of infectious diseases that created the pandemics that killed everybody, like the influenza and the smallpox, did not seem to be as huge a problem until the entire family started coming over by about 1620 or 1618, something like that. And uh, I'm going to be putting some of this on the website because there's really some interesting literature. And one of the uh, wonderful books, devastating books, it's not, there's nothing wonderful about it, but it's beautifully written. It's, uh, it's called um, George Cosby, the, the, the Columbian Exchange, is what it's called, the Columbian Exchange of 1492. And uh, is that the name of it, Anne? <laughs> The Columbian Exchange of 1492, and it's in a remarkable story about, it, it went in both directions. Europeans were also killed by Indian diseases, but further south, in the, further south. Yes? How much success did the Hendricks have in their missionary work? That's a whole, that's a great question, a great question. Um, I think that's a really complex, th that's this, the answer, I believe, is complex because s the Indians definitely saw they could get something. It's, you know, what's in it for me? That's sort of the operational question. So 
Um, some of the, I mean, I mean, I, it's, I, I, I could, we can, I've read around it, but I'm not a specialist on it, so I can't really, call, I won't, I won't speculate as to what numbers. It was huge numbers. Well, there are huge numbers. All the modern-day Abnakis are Catholics, for example. And, and if you look at the baptismal records from starting from the French, New France era, um, just thousands and thousands of indigenous people converted to Catholicism and changed their names, which really created havoc in terms of census keeping and who's Indian and who's not Indian. Then we went into the eugenics movement in the early 20th century where anybody with an Indian name got in, into worse trouble. And so um, it was like it was like being a Jew in Europe, you know, in the 1920s. You just had to change your name or go underground. So, but the baptismal records really track that. All these French, uh, Ang French, French names of Abnaki families. Um, and we know we have Jesuit missions in Vermont. And I haven't found them yet archaeologically. There's one in Colchester. There's one at the mouth of Otter Creek. Um, they have found Jesuit rings in archaeological collections from Addison County. So you can't ever retire when there's so much work to do. <laughs> there's like tons of stuff. Yeah. I was just going to say that uh, one of the places that I can't help but think of when I think about Champlain is uh, a historical marker in one of the favorite homes away from him, a town in Massachusetts. The first white man on these shores landed here, referring to Champlain, in the days of 1607. And I'm just wondering what war in, of course, he that's right. But, uh, he had real problems with those guys, didn't he? Um, and this is very interesting, and he was very bothered by that. So Champlain did that first voyage in 1603, and and um, what was? Did you have a question though? 15, no, I was just going to ask what lured him. What lured him south? Yeah. Abuse them, and uh, I'm just thinking that uh, there was just not a, a way that they could work out, work it out there as well. <coughs> yeah, and um, Champlain, Champlain's dream uh, write, writes about that very um, interestingly, and also the original Champlain journals. journals. Yeah. yeah, the journals are very interesting there. Um, I think the reason why he was traveling is he was a cartographer, and he was. Uh, brilliant at that, and that was one of his assigned tasks by uh, this one, uh, I think it was Henry the, the Fourth, who he was very, very close to. And, um, and some people even speculated right in Champlain's dream that he was a step, uh, the, you know, the, the child of Henry the Fourth, perhaps. And so he was just interested in mapping and uh, uh, naming these places and drawing the maps, and he got the sa south. Exactly, and those early voyages were to see well, where should we establish a colony? Where are people friendly? Where are there some good lands? And um, and they were not friendly. The Wampanoags had some serious problems, but that's because the leader of that expedition, Champlain, was not a leader of these expeditions. He was usually the second, and he wasn't even the second in command. He was just kind of a, a tourist, not a tourist, how do we say this? He was a very important uh, teammate, but he did not run the ship. He was not captain of the expedition. And so he did not, ha he was not able to control the events there in Massachusetts. And I think uh, the fellow in charge of the expedition started shooting, and it was the usual chaos happening very quickly and Champlain being devastated like what why is this happening because he couldn't stop it so then when he um, affirmed, him, affirmed himself in New France he very much then became the leader of the colony but when they were sailing he was not in charge of those first expeditions 
that's an interesting, that, that is a true, I remember that happening, the Wampanoags, that was a mess when he encountered them. Ray. Yes, yes, and um, and this book, Champlain's Dream, is everybody familiar with it now? It's, you know, when I was a kid, I hated history because history was like, oh my God, it was so boring, and all these dates and ooh, just not interesting. Well, this guy named David Hackett Fisher, Hackett, H-A-C-K-E-T-T, -T, David Hackett Fisher, like a compound name. Hey, thank you so much for coming, and don't feel bad for leaving. I mean, thank you for leaving. <laughs> and uh, so David Hackett Fisher wrote this book, just came out in 2008, named Champlain's Dream. Now, Hackett Fisher obviously fell in love with Champlain. It's really interesting to see a historian that falls in love with his character. And, and he, makes him, he, he makes him out to be 100% perfect. But we know Champlain was not perfect. He had some, 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 some issues and stuff. But um, Champlain's Dream, this one particular book, um, what was the question? Where were we going with that? Uh, whether Champlain included any uh, indigenous Yes. Some of the things um, that he talks about were these uh, names that some of them started even from the Basque whalers. And there were some, all these existing geographic names that he learned from his uh, Indian guides. And so he worked very closely with the Indian communities there in terms of naming names and what's your name. And um, so there was a very much a mixed bag. And then bastardized words, including Basque and Innu words. So that could be a whole other dissertation, all the words in Champlain's journal. Just to follow up, uh, you mentioned Champlain was a renaissance. I haven't read this yet, but I sense he learned some of the English and some of the Indian languages. I, I had a sense that he was that interested in these communities, that he learned some of the indigenous languages. But um, some of these folks had been in uh, France because Cartier had brought them over. And of course, that was, what, 90 years earlier. But there was this trade between the Indian peoples and French, tr human trade. And um, so there were always guides to translate, is my sense. And some of the Indians obviously spoke French. And I think some of Champlain and some of his people definitely spoke Montagnais or. Um, spoke they definitely were brilliant linguists. They would have all spoken the Indian language. Thank you very much for coming. Um, so anyway, this book, Champlain's Dream, I'd never listened to books on tape before, and I'm a convert now. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and, um, and Chris, if we, you don't have it here at the library, I think we have some uh, interested uh, potential borrowers now, both the tape and the book. And just <coughs> really, it's almost a, a fictional account. It's that interesting. And when a historian can pull that off, you know that this guy's a very good writer. But we don't want to turn Champlain into a hero because he was not. And some of the stuff that my Abnaki friend, uh, Fred Wiseman, Abnaki, he himself is Abnaki. He's an archaeologist. He's an Abnaki scholar. One of the problems he has with Champlain's dream and other kind of uh, heroism around Champlain in this uh, 400th anniversary is they downplay the complexity of of politics at the Indian in, uh, amongst the Indian nations, and that the Indian nations were very, very um, savvy. They were very uh, politicized. They were organized. They knew what they were doing when they recruited Champlain against the Iroquois, and so who took advantage of whom? You know, it's like who's snooking whom? Definitely, uh, the Indians did fared the worst. They were destroyed by disease, their culture, everything um, was a, dest a destructive uh, trajectory for them. But so Champl uh, what's his name? Hackett Fisher doesn't quite pull this kind of stuff out 
to the Abenakis, to Fred Wiseman's um, uh, regret. But it's there when you read the Champlain journals and when you read the fine print in Hackett's book, you see that these people, um, very powerful Indian nations when Champlain arrived in 1609. And the powerful allegiances and alliances. I'm sorry, go ahead. What town do you live in? Do you have any idea of what kind of musical instruments they might have used? Like a tambour, a tambour? Yeah, the Champlain uh, journals uh, talk about, and, and these are really interesting. And if I were a teacher, I would definitely spend more time in all these primary things. There's a lot of drumming. And definitely you should call the Aben uh, go on the internet, the Abenaki Nation up in Missisquoi have uh, drumming um, troops. And so the drum was like the number one. But I remember reading in the Champlain's Journal of something, some, some kind of uh, flutes. Um, anything else that you all remember if you've read some of this stuff? Some kind of whistle or you know, kind of a blowing instrument of some kind. So the drum is the number one instrument that I absolutely know about. And different kinds of drums, though, different sizes and um, <laughs> the yeah, I would definitely call Well, one of the one of the yeah. one of the um, it's this is an interesting thing that we're interested in music, us as Europeans, we like music and art, and and Fred, this Abenaki scholar, feels somewhat offended that us as Europeans want to celebrate sort of traditional Indians music and art, and. And I think maybe the reason why he's reacting strongly is because there's not enough information out there about how powerful these Indian nations were politically in 1609. And, um, and so we sort of reduce it down to drumming and, uh, and, and costumes and, and art, but which is important to us. Uh, so there's always some tension. Uh, you know, how, how do you tell the story and what's the story that needs to be told and what's the best way to represent the Abenaki's point of view around 1609? That's a hard one. Th who's Abenaki here? There must be uh, Iroquois or Abenaki community members. Jean is. Uh, of course, anybody who's more than fifth generation Vermonter is probably part Abenaki anyway. <laughs> My only regret, I was born in Italy. I can never be at all indigenous. There's no part of me that can be Indian. <laughs> yes? Well, the, it's actually uh, Grant's translation, I think, is more like 1930s. So you should, you should just type in, I would type in Samuel de Champlain in French. You should type it in in French, and then it will come up in French, because I think the original journal in French is there. It abs I'm sure it is, if the English is there. But that's us. The old, the old French. I'm, I'm absolutely happy to stay, and you haven't asked one. At Port, at Port Royal. Yeah. Yeah. 
And Parks Canada does a fabulous job of all the early Champlain settlements. And this was, a, this was an actual village site with a lot of settlers. And he had his gardens there. And, and Parks Canada does a very great job. But I hope you visit Chimney Point State Historic Site, which started this whole journey for me and for a lot of people in this room. And uh, my dear pal and colleague, Elsa Gilbertson, who runs the site down there, and Mount Independence, she's the director of that. So we've got flyers there. And uh, they have the amazing gift shop. If you want to drop $50 without even trying, I recommend the gift shop at Chimney Point State Historic Site, because I can walk in there, and I have to be blindfolded. Uh, they have every single title we've talked about and more. And they have some great, great stuff that we'll have up on the website. So then we'll direct you to Chimney Point to spend some money at our gift shop. When is that open? They're open, well, yeah, by mid-May they'll be open, yeah, five, six days a week. We Which used to be the grist, the, the mill, the windmill. Right, for in the exact same location, a French fortified windmill, which was what tipped the scales and brought French settlement to the um, seigneury. Am I saying that right? The seigneury. Um, because it meant that you could have bread, local bread. You weren't going to see. You weren't about to see a Frenchman without access to bread. And they had free bread, as I recall. And they could just canoe across to get their bread. And it was right there where the lighthouse is now. And so that's where the ceremony, uh, big celebration. Right, the British have a, have a grand jury out there as well. But um, just uh, as a, uh, we, we have something that didn't really hit the media yet, is that <coughs> for the first time in about 20 years, there will also be that same weekend, the, the following day, Sunday morning, and opportunity for about an hour and a half And if you're afraid of heights, bring a friend. <laughs> because it's really, it's incredible looking down from that bridge. <laughs> bring somebody you can hug as you walk across the bridge. So there is a, a website um, that I can email to all of you, and it'll be linked to our Voyages website for the quadricentennial. Because all these events you're talking about, there's like a calendar. And there's more things that you can do than you have hair on all your all our heads combined in 2009 it's going to be uh, a big deal but don't forget it didn't start in, in 1609 it started way before then so thanks for coming everybody <laughs> like that thank you so much did he ever stop at Lewisburg because that then became kind of the center Oh. He did. He, yeah, Nova Scotia was very much, I mean, if, thir if you consider the, the 27 or 37 voyages, he, yeah. was, he had these big settlements at Port Royal and all these other places. Because you mentioned and Port Lewisport Royal, too. And, and of course, Lewisburg, I would gather, dwarfed Port Royal. Yeah. I mean, the, what's there now is enormous. Yeah. And I'm assuming that's from the 1700s as opposed to 1600s. Um, port, thank you for coming, Bobby. Yeah. Well, hey, let's let's see each other sometime. Okay. Listen seriously, seriously. Okay. Always good to see you. Thank you, Tony. Yeah. Yeah. I hope that was not okay. Not bad, but okay. It's okay. Yeah. We, we, we have heard someplace, and I don't remember now where, that they were thinking about closing a lot of them on historic sites, including Mount Independence, etc., etc. Et well, et we're definitely. 
forgive me for walking away oh, from you. Okay. I had to say goodbye to my dear friend, Bob. Those are great questions. So did you um, write your uh, name and? I can, I'll do it over Yeah, I'd love that. I'd love that. And your email, if you have email, I'll be in touch. Um, the Vermont state economy is definitely a mess. Well, yes, I and understand And so they're that. threatening to co close down sites more than even you know than, than now because we're already closed down I think an extra day a week mm -hmm. uh -huh. but, um, but you know I would definitely stay in touch with your legislators this is this is a good time to yeah. talk with your legislators. Well, we, and we do. We go every week to a legislative branch. Okay, so you asked them that question. I did, I did ask, and but I didn't get very far. Who was there? Was it um, Claire, Ayer? Claire was there. Yes. Claire was there. <laughs> and um, Bill Jewett is our representative. Bill Jewett. Uh huh. Well, the thing is that every day we're closed, there are fewer books we sell at the bookshop. Yes. And so that's the uh, economic um, yeah. carrot that you should yeah, remind right, them yeah, of, yeah. that yes. it's minuscule yeah. to have Elsa there or our temporary person yeah. because... So, so let's just, here's hoping. I know. Well, in other words, it's not just a rumor. It is a definite. Well, they're, it's not definite. They're, they're talking everything. You oh, know, okay. hopefully okay. I have okay. my job next month. Hopefully oh, we yeah, all have yeah, our job course. next month. Yeah. 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 yeah, they're, they're, sure. they're it's in desperate straits is what they sound like. Thank you for coming. Hi. You're Duncan's? I'm Duncan's wife. wife. Pleased to meet Duncan. you. I'm looking here. I'm going, Atocha. That's interesting. I recognize that. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Good. Where's and Duncan had to go down. Yeah, he's good to see Florida. you, Kay Hills. Good to see, see you, again. Gordon. We'll see you later. He'll be back next week. So I'm sorry I missed him. I haven't seen him in ages. Yeah, he's, he got to go down. He, he does yeah, on a consulting job. Yeah. So what's it like living in Vermont? Uh, it's it's nice. It's better than a 98 degree temperature and 90 percent humidity. And what um. What grade are you in? I'm in eighth. Eighth grade. So this is a good time to move to Vermont, actually, before high school, maybe. Well. <laughs> maybe not. Yeah. You'll get used to it. You'll be so glad. I have an 11-year-old that, that okay. really. Who's enjoying it? Yeah. And what town are you living in? In Mid Middlebury. Middlebury? Yeah. Well, great. I said, I know that name. And then I said, I know that name. <laughs> great. We'll give Duncan my best. Sure I'll see will. him when I see him. OK. Sure Thanks for coming tonight. Jean. Yeah. Those nice lawn lots, the French lawn lots. I know. I forgot to turn it off. The uh, they Andre has been able to find the names, and we asked. I think we talked about this um, when we were at the Bixby Library. Um, he, he, the lots themselves don't have names. But he's been able to track some of the names, like the Spayard family, to that lot through, um, I don't know if they're census records or what, but through some archival. Well, the records and the parish records, that was fun at some of those. And that's where, that he, and he must be looking at those. Yeah, that's where he's looking at them. Yeah, he has. He's in Idaho now. He's in Idaho? Yeah, he moved to Idaho to Boise full time because his wife is there at the university. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, there's the oh, Idaho connection. Yeah. yeah, he's full time there now, and he wrote a very nice little uh, contribution to our publication. Oh, I did see And that. so he's, um, yeah. and that'll come out in about, about six weeks. We'll have to, we have to get it done. So yeah. do you have a website now? The website now is just some of the pages from the last, you know, the last summer's work, and some of the teacher stuff. Yeah, so it's historicvermont.org. Because I tried, I'm trying to find it now. I can't. For the Vermont Archaeology or this, the, the, the voyages. Here. I I, sh I need to do do more than that. Oh, thank you very much for signing in, Davy. Oh, jeez. Oh, thank you.